so I'm just trying to set a timer for myself so I don't do what I did last year, which was entirely to have way, way too much for, for the time allotted. But unfortunately, I have way, way too much for the time allotted. <laughs> and it's even worse than that, because last year, at least, I had a coherent story to tell. Um, this time, I'm talking about what I happened to learn about the state of TOTP standards in the process of rewriting 1Password's TOTP authenticator app uh, kind of stuff. And it was really just a matter of stumbling across um, uh, various things. So uh, just uh, point out that, uh, that later this evening, you definitely want to be around, talk to people, but also going to be spending some time on Reddit, apparently, uh, for an Ask Me Anything. Um, so there's that. That's Morgan, not a cat. <laughs> and I'm actually going to pretty much assume that people know what TOTP is, time-based, one-time passwords. Um, uh, but there are some kittens. Uh, initial setup, the server generates a code with some other metadata, typically presents it as a QR code to the user, authenticator app scans it, gets this thing in, and then has a long-term secret. Um, process looks like that. Uh, that uh, we get nice bobcats in my neighborhood. I don't, I never got any good pictures of her kittens, so you don't have a kitten, just a bobcat. Um, and you're all familiar with this, so I'm just going to skip past it. And then um, this is how it can look in, a, in an authenticator app. Uh, that, by the way, is Mr. Talk. Uh, this is the neighbor's cat. Well, drawing of the neighbor's cat. And if you read our blog or even our white paper, you'll learn about how the nefarious Mr. Talk is always trying to mess things up for uh, the dogs, Patty and Molly. Okay, and while I don't want to talk about TOTP and what it's for and what its value is, I was given a challenge, challenge accepted, and um, one of the values of TOTP is that it is a one-time password. Uh, and one-time passwords are good compared to more traditional uh, password uh, methods because with more traditional password methods, and here we're talking about some very traditional ones, uh, which I got to learn about at the Vasa Museum, uh, is how uh, ships at sea would signal to each other kind of their friend or foe mechanisms. And these, of course, could be overheard. And so it would be much nicer for things to be one time. OK. Now, before I get into other things about TOTP, I want to try to convince you about why standards matter. Um, and so there's this apocryphal story that a journalist asked Mahatma Gandhi, uh, what do you think of Western civilization? to which the story goes, he replied, I think it would be a good idea. Now, nobody has actually asked me what I think of TOTP standards, but you can predict my answer. I think it would be a good idea. And standards matter not only because they allow us to build interoperable systems that actually work, but they help us avoid ambiguity. And while we can tolerate ambiguity in natural language, um, like, you know, let's take a set of sentences, make sure that the kids are at the table and ready to eat. Here's a sharp knife, get the tomatoes ready to eat. Here's a sharp knife, get the chicken ready to eat. Yeah, there are different ways of interpreting that. Um, and so this kind of ambiguity that we have in natural language is, it can lead to problems on occasion, 
but it can't really be systematically automated. It, it cannot be abused systematically um, in an automated kind of way. While ambiguity in other systems um, can. So here's just an example of some HTTP headers. Again, I'm not talking about TOTP yet. Um, and you know, this might be part of an HTTP request, uh, perfectly valid. Here is a version that violates the standards, and the difference is that there is a space between the accept language and the colon. And we can imagine, again, I don't know the history about this, but we could imagine a situation back in the days of the browser wars, back in the days when nobody was following, you know, when, when, uh, when everyone was trying to get market share on these kinds of things, um, that some client or other occasionally sent things this way, occasionally put spaces um, between the field name and the colon. And you could imagine some developer saying, well, are we going to reject these as invalid? Or should we accommodate them? What harm could possibly come from accommodating non-conforming clients? Um, you know, so that became a thing. Uh, updated RFC uh, actually pointed out that this did become a problem. And this was updated in 2014 you know, saying no white space is allowed between the header, field name, and colon. In the past, differences in handling of such white space have led to security vulnerabilities. And, oh, okay, I don't have the additional slide for that. Uh, this same bug popped up again just this past September. Uh, there were a couple libraries that still mimicked the behavior of the older software that was trying to accommodate um, uh, client sell, uh, sending malformed data. So even though nobody at the time could imagine how just being accommodating, accepting uh, that uh, malformed data, it turned out to be a, it turned out to actually be a substantial security bug which I'm not going to describe. You can read all about it elsewhere. But I'm um, using it as an illustration of something recently um, in, the, well, in the news yet again of how a tiny non-compliance with standard of being extra liberal in what you accept uh, leads to entirely unanticipated security bugs. OK, so the old joke is that the problem with standards is that we have so many of them. Uh, but here, these things that I'm calling standards should all actually work together uh, to define how TOTP, um, uh, how, how TOTP works today uh, in practice. And so the first one of these is the HOTP RFC, uh, hash-based one-time passwords. Uh, and it, it basically describes all the math and computation for, uh, for having your long-term secret um, and for, for HOTP accounter, and then uh, computing something like a six-digit code. Um, it defines something that it calls dynamic truncation. Name doesn't make sense to me. You could, uh, that basically takes the HMAC result, the hash that you get of, of the counter and the long-term secret, down to something that's 31 bits long. Uh, it defines the algorithm for getting from that 31-bit thing to your six-digit code, uh, and it has plenty of errata. Um, man, that thing has typos in it and other problems. But anyway, it's, it's, it's well-defined. Uh, and of course, at the time that it was constructed, 
the, uh, the hash algorithm for the HMAC was SHA-1. OK, the TOTP RFC is much more recent. Uh, it basically says, instead of a counter, you use the current time you know, since the beginning of the universe, rounded down to 30-second intervals. Um, and uh, mentions other hashes you can use. It has lots and lots of stuff about time that we can ignore. And, uh, and, but that is basically the TOTP stuff. Now, what Google did, Google did this brilliant thing. TOTP was sitting around gathering dust, and they found a way to make this, or they offered a way to make this really nicely configurable. So it's something that actual real people could use and services could offer nicely. And so this, was, this is the OTP auth scheme. Um, and it was published with the source for Google Authenticator. And so it takes a URI like this with the scheme OTP auth. Uh, I can specify TOTP, HOTP, uh, uh, gives an account identifier, and lots of parameters. The required one uh, is the secret, which is, um, as they say, a base32 encoded uh, secret. Uh, base and uh, for some odd reason, they refer to an obsolete uh, base32 RFC, which was still obsolete at the time. And this has been a fantastic thing. I mean, you know, yes, TOTP's days are numbered, but you know, it it filled the need was a really good thing, um, and making it available this way is really kind of nice. Uh, let me just skip to the base32 RFC because you'd think that none of the conflict about standards would have to do with different interpretations of base 32. That's like a really simple thing. Um, uh, OK, so base 32 uh, has, um, has an alphabet of 32 characters, mostly uppercase letters, some, some digits. It encodes bytes. And it is supposed to provide a one-to-one -one mapping. That is, if you've got a set of bytes, it should encode to only one base32 string. And if you've got a base32 string, it should decode to only one sequence of bytes. Um, it also has a nice little warning about uh, strict parsing. OK. Um, So the first thing in my list of why there's some confusion about standards um, is, again, quoting from, quoting from uh, Google, from the OTP auth scheme, the digits parameter may have the values 6 or 8 and determines how long of a one-time passcode pass to display to the user. The default is 6. And this is really, you know, that's fine. That, kind, that is one set of effectively a standard. Um, now, of course, Google Authenticator didn't actually follow this. Google Authenticator on Android silently ignores the digits parameter. It will just always do six digits. Google Authenticator on iOS uh, will recognize the eight digits thing. OK. Um, but when we look at these number of digits, let's try to figure out what digits do make sense or what the standards say. And the standards back from the HOTP RFC, really nice and clear. Uh, the number of digits must be at least six. Great. Nice, clear statement from the RFC. Now, we have to ask, what does the RFC say about the maximum number of digits? It says this. <laughs> uh, 
Um, and if you think I'm joking, there we go. Picture, that's the RFC. Um, and really, there's no place else in the RFC that I could find where it said what the maximum number is. Uh, this uh, bit of math that's stuck in Appendix A is designed to give you an estimate or a way to calculate uh, how much of a modulo bias you get with different, um, uh, with different settings of this. And so I could work through an example with nine digits, but I'm not going to. And, uh, but we should assume that you know, a user uh, would think that going from six digits to eight digits would make the thing 100 times stronger. And that actually turns out to be true, or close enough. So going from five digits to six digits uh, is, you know, it, it increases strength by almost 10 times. That's fully in line with what users would expect. Going from six digits to seven digits also is pretty close to 10. And going from seven digits to eight digits um, is, again, not extremely close to 10, but close enough to 10 that we could say, yeah, this isn't really deviating far from expectations. Uh, going from eight digits to nine digits only gives you a seven, point, a seven and a third uh, fold increase in strength. Going from nine digits to 10 digits gives you uh, a strength increase of approximately three. Really, it's not actually exactly three. It just turns out to be really close to three, but I'm uh, rounded uh, to that. Um, you know, and if you want to find out how much, you just do the math that's in Appendix A. Um, and going from 10 digits to 11, or any increase after that, does not increase the strength at all, not a bit. So there's a table of stuff. And so generally, the conclusion is for the maximum, eight makes perfect sense. Nine is a bit of security theater. 10 is ridiculous security theater. Um, and anything above 10 is just absolutely absurd. But um, and I didn't collect this information at the time, but I have seen suggestions out there where people are saying, oh, TOTP stuff can be, you know, brute force tracked, so we should ramp it up to 11. Just don't do that. Uh, but again, there, there's nothing in the standard saying that. There's only the, the HOTP standard that gives you a way to calculate this. OK. Um, now, another thing that happens is that sometimes you're not actually parsing the URI. You're not, your, your authenticator app is not specifically parsing this, you know, this thing with this OTP auth scheme, nice formatted URI. Uh, but there are times when users can be prompted or suggested or need to effectively just enter the, uh, the long-term secret into their authenticator app. Uh, there's an example from how Dropbox does it. And, uh, and it's perfectly reasonable that what Dropbox did here was putting in white space uh, white space is not part of the base32 encoding library. Also, lowercase is not part of the base32 um, uh, alphabet, but I actually agree that this is completely correct and reasonable behavior. But again, it would be nice if somehow or other this was standardized. Okay, oh wow. 
Um, so, stop that. <laughs> cancel, cancel. You still have, you still have Tommy down. Yeah. Okay, I have no idea what that was doing. Okay. Um, uh, so, but now suppose somebody pastes in the wrong thing into their Authenticator app. Suppose they paste in the location of the site that they're at. Um, so, what should an Authenticator app do in parsing this kind of input? Uh, should it report an error and not construct a TOTP secret? Uh, should it truncate at the first non-base32 and non-space character so it would just use HTTPS as the base32 that it would then uh, decode? Or should it just strip out all the non-base32 characters and so use everything that was in that string that Munt's K suggested is actually in the base32 uh, alphabet? And so I'd actually like to see a show of hands. Uh, who thinks that they should do number three, which is just strip out everything that is non-base32? Okay, who thinks number two, truncate at the first, um, uh, truncate at the first non-base 32 character? I can't see because of the lights. And who thinks number one? Yes, that would be nice. <laughs> most apps do number three. <laughs> In fact, I mean, when I say most, I pretty much mean, well, I, I've no longer kept track of what everyone does. But for the most part, that is the behavior. Uh, and so you can now imagine uh, something like this, where the string contains potentially hostile uh, content. Uh, your app might still be storing it in its raw form and not just uh, the secret after it's um, uh, after it's done this stuff. Anyway, my opinion is, like everyone's here, is that it should report an error to the user. Uh, I can tell you that what I'm told by our various teams is that reporting errors to users when something works on a competing authenticator app uh, is <laughs> not highly... Um, is not highly appreciated. And furthermore, it's definitely not appreciated if we previously accepted it and then start reporting an error. So when I first submitted the talk, I was, I was hoping to be able to come here and say, well, at least now we report an error. But I can't say that. OK, and uh, not only do you and I agree on this, the base 32 standards actually say, really, don't do that. If there's, if there's some non-base 32 character in there, just reject it. This is almost certainly a, a sign or a thing you have attack. OK. Um, so another thing is the uh, choice of hash function. I actually um, mentioned this earlier. Uh, the TOTP standards. Um, uh, specify a number of uh, hash functions. The, um, this is from Google's uh, OTP auth thing. You can specify a parameter uh, with different hash functions. And in Google Authenticator, this algorithm parameter is completely ignored. So the service could say it's going to use SHA-256, Google Authenticator is just going to process it with SHA-1. The consequence of this is that no service offers SHA-256 because if they do, 
then users who are using Google Authenticator won't be, a, won't be generating correct codes, or won't be generating the same codes that the server does for the same data. So we seem to be stuck with SHA-1 forever. Um, OK, base 32 encoding. You'd think that this is uncontroversial. It's really standard. There are lots of tools that do it in a nice standard way. Um, now, base 32 encoding, each thing for the base 32 alphabet corresponds to five bits. But it only is designed to decode sequences of bytes. So if you want the byte um, that's described here, 1010101010, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, zero. Uh, I think that corresponds to 170 decimal. But anyway, you will. It's more than it's more than five bits, so you're going to need more than one base uh, base 32 character. Uh, you would encode it this way with V and I, and the two bits. Um, uh, that you end up not using because, again, you're, getting, you're going to get 10 bits altogether. Uh, these are your trailing bits. And the base 32 encoding, as I said earlier, they want it so that you've got a one-to-one -one mapping, so that the number, so that, uh, so that any sequence of bytes corresponds to just one base 32 string, and a base 32 string should decode to only one sequence of bytes. So, uh, so the standards say that your trailing bits should just be 0, 0, as they were in that previous slide, but they say if you have some compelling need, as somebody does, that they don't name in the standards, but they talk about some systems requiring it, you can allow for non-canonical um, non uh, base 32 encoding. Um, but again, your standard libraries um, will give you canonical ones, and your standard libraries, most of them report an error when you're going in the other direction. If you take a, something that is non-canonically encoded, and you decode it to bytes, and it has non-zero trailing bits this way, uh, they error, typically. Um, another way of getting in, in this case, totally invalid, base 32, is if you have an entirely superfluous base 32 character. So here, we've got three characters. That's going to correspond to 15 bits. So it's still one byte and some extra bits. You get, um, so that K is entirely superfluous. Um, this is a length violation, um, and you get this with base 32 strings that are, that are of length of 1, 3, or 6 mod 8. Um, well, back to Google Authenticator, because of course that was the first thing that was released. Um, they appear to have known that they were doing base 32 a little funny. Um, and so they've got this, this, this comment about their implementation not really being compliant and that they uh, accept these things of bizarre length. Um, they've got uh, something that checks for trailing bits that is nicely commented out. Um, and so, in a, instead of using a standard or common uh, base 32 encoding library, they basically have their own that they stuck in there. Uh, of course, it's different on iOS. Uh, it rejects different cases. Okay, um, and now uh, the question about the length of the secret. 
uh, the only place I could find anything at all about how long the, sh the long-term shared secret is, is from the HOTP RFC, and it says it should correspond to 128 bits. Uh, and so if you're actually going to use base32 encoding, that's going to give you a 26-character string. Um, and I haven't done a survey, but I suspect that a large number of services are, um, are using TOTP secrets that are smaller than that. And again, we've got the question of what should authenticator apps do? Should they continue as they are? Oh, I should tell you what they all do. Uh, I'm going to say many because I haven't surveyed all of them. Uh, apps accept secrets as short as a single byte. That's usually the consequence of stripping out everything that isn't in the base32 alphabet when they're given junk. Uh, so, should they continue as they are? Should they re reject setups with short secrets? Should they warn users about short secrets? Um, votes for number one. That was the continue as they are. Okay, somebody had to say that. Reject setups with short secrets. And warn users about short secrets. Yeah, well, they're, you know, it'd be nice. Um, maybe we'll get there. Uh, okay, and just to add some complete miscellaneous nonsense um, that came up across the way, is there's a rival to the OTP auth scheme in a URI, and it is YJOTP. And as far as we can tell, it behaves exactly the same as OTP auth, but it's issued by Yahoo Japan. Yahoo is apparently very popular in Japan. And yeah, we've got some users who have YJ OTP auth schemes, and so we, you know, we're asked to accept and parse those. Uh, the best we've been able to find out about this, there's no documentation from Yahoo Japan, is that some message boards in, in Japan had some reverse engineering of it. And so, just more weirdness. Okay, so again, there isn't a coherent thing about this talk because it's like every place you look, there's some weirdness in the standards. Um, and I'm concluding now with telling you who I am. How am I for time? You are pretty spot on. You actually have three more minutes. I could go through the math of how we, <laughs> I, uh, you know, you know. I mean, I, I'll, I'll, you know, the slides give you some tables, and I'll eventually get up there the little calculators that I wrote. Um, but, uh, <laughs> um, okay. Okay. Thank you, Jeff.